how in the hell did we go from this to this? Now, a month ago, I'd never seen a single Fast and Furious movie. It's not like I was intentionally avoiding them, it's just one of those franchises I never got around to watching. But with Fast 10 coming out in just a few days, and with so many of you asking for a video on the Fast and Furious, I decided to finally give them a watch. And so I watched all nine films in less than two weeks. And I have thoughts. Lots of thoughts. Like how there's so many similarities between the Fast and Furious movies and the MCU, with team-ups across films and numerous character deaths and resurrections. In a series full of mediocre performances, Scott Eastwood stands alone. His performance in Fate of the Furious is the single dullest thing in the entire franchise. Now, Mr. Nobody said that if we're going to have a chance at catching Dom, we're going to have to be damn fast. Even the rat in the bucket in Too Fast, Too Furious showed more range and complexity. <laughs> Seriously, the guy's cardboard. I could write an entire dissertation on the absurdity of the rock sweat in Fast Five, attempting in vain, I'm sure, to calculate just how much sweat was dripping off of his face and arms, while everyone else around him was bone dry. It's amazing. But in this video, I want to focus on just how in the hell the franchise across nine films went from this to this. A lot has changed in the span of nine films across the Fast and Furious franchise, and there's a turning point in there somewhere that's altered the trajectory, resulting in where we are now. Has the series flown too close to the sun as of late? Absolutely. But there were some much needed changes in the earlier films that has made the series this gargantuan franchise that it is now. But what changed? And when exactly is the day the Fast and Furious franchise was born? I don't have friends. I got family. But first, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, Ridge. Father's Day is just around the corner, and maybe it's just me, but I think men are notoriously hard to shop for. My dad never gives me any ideas, I usually just end up giving him the same set of golf balls year after year. If you're stuck buying the same gift for someone year after year, then do yourself a favor and go check out Ridge. Just like phones have changed dramatically over the past 20 years, that's what Ridge is doing with wallets and keys. I used to carry this, this big old bulky wallet that would rip over time and would get so big that it would become uncomfortable and almost hurt my back when I'd be sitting on it. I also tried no wallet, but then everything is just loose in my pockets, falling out, or I forgot some card as I went somewhere, or I didn't have my ID, or I didn't have money. This is what I used to have, but now here is the Ridge wallet. It's slick, slim, durable, it holds up to 12 cards, plus it has a money clip. A lot different than those old bulky dad wallets. It comes in over 30 colors and styles, including carbon fiber, burnt titanium, forged ember, and burnt Damascus. And it was designed with RFID blocking materials that protects you from digital pickpocketers. Ridge key cases securely and silently hold one to six keys. They're tucked in so slim in your pocket. I really love this thing. It also has a clip so you can clip it to your pants. Father's Day is one of Ridge's biggest sales of the year. So hurry and go over to ridge.com slash entertain the elk. That way you can get up to 40% off your order through June 15th. Ridge has over 3 million customers, over 50,000 five-star reviews, and they're so confident that you'll love their product that they'll let you give it a test drive for 99 days. And if you don't end up liking it, you can send it back for a full refund. Oh, and the durability of these wallets means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. So you can keep giving those same boring gifts year after year after year, or you can give them something they actually want by going to ridge.com slash entertain the elk. Thank you, Ridge, for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to the essay. It all started with the simple premise of underground drag racing culture of New York City. 
Director Rob Cohen read an article about it and thought that the idea of combining fast-paced racing and crime would combine to make some excellent movie. I mean, it wasn't a wildly inventive idea. I mean, just replace the fast cars with surfboards and you have Point Break. Literally, they're the same movie. The first Fast and Furious was far more interested in racing culture than the recent installments, and definitely had a more gritty and grounded tone. Except for some of the drag racing moments that had surreal visuals, like something out of a video game. The heist sequences were kept really simple, taking place usually on an abandoned road, with just one or two elements to juggle, like a few cars and a weapon or two. It was a simple premise, and despite some choppy dialogue and mediocre performances, The film still stands as one of the best in the franchise, and a solid foundation to build on. The first three films really feel like the franchise trying to find itself. The excellent chemistry from the four leads in the first film was abandoned in Too Fast Too Furious, as we just focused on Brian as our central character in a different location and with a different supporting cast. And then in Tokyo Drift, all our established characters were now gone. In many ways, I respect Tokyo Drift for trying to branch off and do something different than the first two films, though a lot of the same story beats played out. Fish out of water character, immersed in a unique racing culture, riddled with crime. The franchise still didn't have any meaningful characters worthy to build itself around. But then a major shift happened in the fourth film, Fast and Furious. As the title suggests, it was going back to the one element that made the first film work so well mainly the chemistry of its four main leads. The film opens with Dom in the middle of another high-speed robbery, a callback to the opening scene of the original Fast film, though this time, the scene is truly from Dom's perspective. He's not some mysterious, masked stranger, and he's not reduced to some plot point or side character. In the original film, Dom is kept at arm's length, really only existing when Brian is there. But now we're getting to follow Dom's perspective too, his own fears, desires and motivations, making him a driving force, pun intended, in this film, unlike the original. Now he's every bit the main character as Brian. We experience this film through Brian and Dom. Some plot points unfold through Dom's perspective, and some unfold through Brian's. This is what the franchise was missing. Brian was a solid character, but his counterparts always seemed to be more dynamic and complex. Now, of course, Brian made them more interesting through conflict, serving as the side of the law against outlaws. But elevating Dom as a central character in the series was a massive turning point in the Fast and Furious franchise. I could understand someone arguing that the fourth entry, Fast and Furious, was the main turning point in the series from a plot perspective. Dom and Brian were back, now as co-leads, but also, at the end of the film, there's another major shift as Brian abandons his career as an undercover agent in order to rescue Dom from prison. After three movies of Brian straddling the line between law and outlaw, he finally switched sides and chose family. But to me, I think there was a larger tonal shift that rippled throughout the entire franchise, and that first started in the next entry, Fast Five. First, Fast Five completely altered the genre of the series. Whereas one through four were simple crime dramas, Fast Five became something different. It became more of an Ocean's Eleven style team-up heist adventure. This change in genre is something that would continue to happen as future installments dipped more into spy, espionage territory. Now, do the films accomplish these genre shifts flawlessly? Hell no. Even in Fast Five, which by the way, I think is far and away the best entry in the franchise, they spend the majority of the film working on an epic heist, meticulously plotting, training, and quietly preparing, just to do a smash and grab job that is anything but subtle. But this shift in genre did inject the franchise with a much needed sense of levity. The first few films were plagued with this sense of over-seriousness, dripping time and time again into melodrama. Sure, the creators kept some melodrama, but they also upped the amount of fun. They brought back Roman and Tej from the second film, Han from the third, and Giselle from the fourth to create this team of clashing personalities that always felt entertaining. I find it really interesting that in a series where the precedent of drag racing had been set, there was a clear opportunity for that again in Fast Five, but they chose instead to omit it. 
It's like the creators were aware of this paint-by-number structure the franchise was falling into and chose to subvert it. Call for call. You want to come and get it? And that brings me to the other major tonal shift that happens in Fast Five. All of the action scenes that happened in the first four films were relatively grounded. Fast cars on a road. Now there were a couple elements added each time to help add complexity and to help break monotony. A shotgun, a boat, a cliff, a tunnel. But they all still felt like shades of the same color. The first four films focused a lot more on car culture and drag racing. But by changing the genre, they were able to open up the franchise to these more insane, complex, and dynamic action sequences. And in the opening action scene of Fast Five, you could tell that everything had changed. The set pieces were bigger, and there were so many more moving parts, multiple factions working against each other, the ticking clock to build intensity, a truck slamming into the train, surfing a car off of a cliff, one of the biggest changes was the addition of high-tech equipment. It's almost funny when you compare this action scene to the opening action scene from the original film that consisted of an empty road, a crossbow, baseball bat, and a tranquilizer dart. The craziest moments in the first few films always seem to just revolve around nitrous oxide. How much you have, and hitting the NAS button at the right time. <laughs> But now here in the opening action scene to Fast Five, we have a keycard scanner, blowtorches, and the Mongo truck that yanked cars off the train. I mean, even that seems tame now compared to where the franchise would eventually go. But the creators were striking a better balance of heightened reality. And they were certainly giving audiences something new that they hadn't seen before in the franchise up to this point. And that's just the first action sequence in Fast Five. There's also the slum chase, the ambush, of course, you have to mention the epic showdown between Dom and Hobbs. And then there's the vault heist at the end of the movie. A ridiculous, over-the-top scene that began losing any sense of reality. It's great, it's stupid, and I love it. But it certainly was a harbinger of things to come in a franchise that's expected to go bigger and bigger and louder and crazier with each new film. And that growing pressure to meet that expectation is what's birthed ridiculous action scenes with tanks, airplanes, submarines, zombie cars, skyscrapers, leading to the most recent entry, F9, that had Vin swinging his car across a chasm, a magnetic truck pulling and flipping cars, and of course, the rocket car in outer space crashing into a satellite. But I'm getting off track, and all of this sounds like a topic for a future video. The first four films in the series was really the franchise finding itself, experimenting with what worked and what didn't work. The last couple films have been Fast and Furious losing itself again, abandoning any real sense of humanity and reality. But it was in Fast Five that they completely nailed it, embodying all the elements that made the series great. Which is why that's the day Fast and Furious was born. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it with a friend, but also leave me a comment below. Tell me the moment that you think Fast and Furious was born. Do you think I got it right? Did I get it wrong? Also, let me know if you're looking forward to seeing Fast 10 or Fast X. Thanks again to Ridge for sponsoring this video. Again, go check them out. Go to ridge.com slash entertain the elk. It really is a great gift idea. And one of the best ways you can help support my channel is by checking out the sponsors that I'm working with. That's the best way that I can help forge relationships and continue to work with them in the future. Thanks again, everyone, for watching this video. Go enjoy Fast 10, and I will see you all next time.